Hi, I believe when you know better, you do better. Having been at the front lines of election coverage since 2002 and having covered the 2005 and 2010 referendums, I have some insights and perspectives that I want to share, but perhaps particularly important was 2007 and 2008 when I underwent a mediation process training on some of the techniques used in Rwanda to bring communities back together following uh, the violence during the genocide. So allow me to share some important insights with you in particular on the issue of the importance of peace and the importance of credible elections. And by the end of this video, I'm hoping that you will understand that peace and credible elections are two things that stand together, that complement each other, pillars that hold a nation or a society up. Yes, both of them are critical. Credible elections ultimately means justice for each and every one of us. And justice thrives in an environment of peace. You can lobby and demonstrate peacefully for justice. You can change things in an environment of peace. However, injustice thrives in an environment of conflict and violence. And whatever injustice you are trying to address through conflict and violence will breed a multiplicity of other injustices, just making the problems far worse. And ultimately, the biggest problem is that hurts the most vulnerable in society. Not the wealthy, not the leaders, the most vulnerable. Let me draw an analogy for you that I think is important for you to understand the relationship between the two. Let's imagine that there's a village where every five years a huge market day is held and within that market day there are special offers, free goodies and giveaways, huge opportunities, but you've got to get in with a ticket. So the good news is that everybody in the village gets a ticket and they come and line up excited to get into the market. However, the organizers of the market announced that they've decided that people will separate into two lines. And line one will get in with a ticket. Line two has to pay a premium on top of the ticket. Now line two are shocked. They're shamed. They're enraged. Why would you be so unfair to us? How can you do this? How come line one get treated better and we get treated worse? Line one, some of them are excited and don't care. But certainly there are some people in line one asking, why are we being unfair to line two? Within a few minutes, the tension is building up and someone in line two picks a stone. He's angry and he throws it. The stone lands on a woman holding a child and they both go down. The man next to them is angered. Why have you just hit? an innocent woman and child and starts shouting at line two. Someone else in line two is not having it anymore and emboldened by the stone that he just saw, saw thrown to the other side, he rushes at line one and smashes into a few people in line one. Somebody else sees an opportunity, grabs a handbag, throws a woman to the floor and then starts to rape her. A baby is crying in the distance. All mayhem. Line one are not having it. The men have gathered together and they hit line two. Suffering, pain, violence, more children are screaming, more children are crying, the elderly are down or running away. The crazy thing is, the organizers, when the violence started, immediately left the scene. They're gone, they're not hurt. The people fight. A sad and shocking situation, but it's the truth. That's what conflict does. Conflict builds really fast and like a fire before you know it, it engulfs everything. At some point in the future, a divided village might ask, how did this all happen? A smart divided village will ask, why did we turn against each other when it wasn't us? It was the organizers. Was there a better way? Someone in line one will say, I was willing to stand with you guys in line two. And together we could all have said, we are not entering unless you ensure we have the same rules. That we could have peacefully demonstrated or simply walked away and forced the organizers to listen to us, the people. My point is very simple. That the greatest leaders have led change and sustained transformational change through peaceful engagement. 
violence and revolutionary change often results in even more unjust situations. Let's look at Mahatma Gandhi and what he did for India. Let's look at Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Let's look at Nelson Mandela who started with violence but moved towards the use of peace and reconciliation. Let's look at the greatest revolutionary of all time. His name was Jesus Christ and he used peaceful methods. The truth is any leaders, civil society activists or players who are pushing for violence as a way to address injustice are intellectually challenged and they are morally corrupt because they know, especially the leaders and the activists, that violence breeds violence. They also know that it is the most vulnerable who are hurt the most in times of violence. I'm talking about children, babies, women who are ripped apart and raped or enslaved, boys who are turned into child soldiers. This is the reality, Kenya. This is the reality. Men who are either targeted for death or militarized. That's what conflict is. So the way to address injustices, if you believe there might be an issue with elections, we come out of election, God willing, all will be well. However, if we come out of elections with questions, the way to address those questions is peacefully. That is the civilized thing to do, and we are not primitive. So for those trying to pull us into being primitive, would you put your wife on the front line first, or your son, or your daughter, or your father, or your mother? Because you know you have the capacity to put your family on planes and fly them out, right? Don't be cheated. The middle class have the capacity to leave. I could leave this country and I could probably live in any part of the world and make a successful life there. I talk about peace, not for me. I talk about peace for the women and the children and the men that would be affected who cannot leave. Where will they go? Where will they go? And you only have to look at South Sudan to ask yourself, why would we talk like this? And so let us accept together that if there is issues with credible elections, that we can march together to have them addressed, but in a peaceful way, that peace is not to be sacrificed at the altar of anything else. Peace is critical, peace is important, and peace gives you an environment to address injustices. Conflict and violence breeds a multiplicity of injustices. There is a name for people who use conflict and violence to address socio-economic and political issues, to coerce communities or leadership into going their way. That word is terrorism. We call them terrorists. So why would you go via a route that you know to be so egregious? That if you use conflict against innocence, because you may start conflict in one way, but it it moves so fast, and I will say again, inevitably, the most innocent get hurt. What's the difference between you and those vile men in Westgate? Those vile men who went into Garissa University and took our children's lives? And so let me end by saying this. If your leaders won't put themselves in the front line, then don't let them put you. You are not collateral damage. And I'm talking to people on all sides of the political divide. Whether you are orange, whether you are red, whether you are blue or green, I don't care. It matters. <laughs> it matters. Your life matters. Your children's lives matter. Your mother and father's lives matter. The poor people of this country deserve better than to be used as political tools to coerce certain actions. I, as a Kenyan, have a stand and I will vote. But I, as a proud Kenyan, also say, if my vote does not win, I will support the president who is elected. And he will be, if there was a she, it would have been great if there was a she, but there are no she's. But he, whoever might win, will be my president. And I will do everything I can to help them be successful because them being successful is me as a Kenyan being successful. So let's stop this nonsense of wrapping our lives around politics in such a way that we are ready to sacrifice ourselves without realizing 
a lot of people speaking of conflict and violence being the only way forward are people who can't get on those planes. Don't do this to yourself. Let's value and understand peace. Let's also value and understand great societies and great leaders use tools that encompass peace to create change. And it is possible. We've seen it happen over and over again. Don't be cheated that you can't. You can. You can create powerful movements. But we've been too lazy or too self-serving to use this difficult method. Yes, it takes energy to organize, bring people together, and, and build a mass movement. But that's what you do. You don't take a rock and throw it wherever it might land, because then you are responsible of injustice. And so, let's hope and pray for peaceful elections and credible elections. And let's remember those two things, they belong together. They are sisters and they are complementary. And let's never accept violence as an option because that, my friends, is terrorism. <laughs>